All right, hey everybody. So today we are doing recommendation engines, uh, the first of the four project topics. Um, and this I would say is also one of the shorter ones. Um, I'll show you all like in terms of uh, the project, what this specific project is gonna look like after we get some context from today. Um, also a quick announcement before, um, before we get started. Next week, Monday is a holiday and Thursday I will be out of office due to moving. It won't affect any of our study groups because we meet on Tuesdays and Wednesdays as well. But um, yeah, just know that I won't be here, but if you have any questions, I will still pop it on the Slack channel uh, intermittently during those two days. So if you have any questions, throw them in the channel. Um, you'll have a better chance of it being seen um, in those, if you, throw your, if you throw your questions in there versus DMing it to me. Um, cool, so today we're doing recommendation engines. Again, we'll talk more through uh, project details in a little bit. And if you know that you're keen on doing the recommendation systems project, more than welcome to start working on it pretty much after you start getting the material. They're, I'm not going to stop you all from like starting the project once you've seen uh, something that you want to work on. All right. So uh, by the way, this is very similar to the workshop that I did last month or a little bit over a month ago. So a lot of repetition, but we're going to go into a little bit more depth uh, with this one. So what we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna to talk about different kinds of recommendation engines, talk about concepts between, uh, concepts behind each kind of engine as well as pros and cons of different ones and when to use which. After this, I also have a notebook where I'm gonna go over the implementation of recommendation engines because there are some slight nuances. Um, it is very similar to scikit-learn, but you have to be very careful not to confuse it with scikit-learn. Uh, so I'll talk through those details later as well. All right, so, um, there are three main types of recommendation engines. First, there is non-personalized, there's content-based recommendation engines, and then there's collaborative filtering. Uh, in our curriculum material and for this project, we will actually be focusing on collaborative filtering recommendation engines, but I'm going to talk through some of the ways that we can use um, other models that we've already learned or models that we're going to learn to do content-based as an example. So, why do we need recommendation engines and what are some examples? Uh, I've mentioned a couple of times that uh, recommendation engines, I, I like a lot because it is a product in and of itself, right? Like after you're done with the machine learning modeling, if you're doing classification, uh, it's still kind of analysis and very, anal yeah, it's, an, it's analytics based. Uh, you don't really have a product out of that. I mean, you can turn it into a product, but there's like usually a couple other steps that come afterwards. But for recommendation engine, once you do the machine learning, that in and of itself is the product. So I like that a lot. Um, why do we need recommendation engines? There's just so much stuff in the world. Uh, I think recommendation engines, they're everywhere. They're more than you know the typical Netflix, Spotify that are very obvious to us. Uh, ads, every ad is um, more and more so becoming like a recommendation engine or there's a recommendation engine driving the ads that you get. Once you see personalized ads, you know it's some sort of recommendation engine. Uh, so in talking about, about that, we've mentioned some examples already. Cool. So first, let's talk about non-personalized recommendation engines. I forget how much is on this page. Okay, there we go. So some examples of non-personalized recommendation engines, top-rated items, you, maybe you want to push your most bought, watched, or consumed items, or maybe you want to push items that will give companies the highest return on investment. Um, here you can see this is an example of a new user to YouTube. And what do they recommend you when you're first logging onto YouTube as a new user? Whatever is trending. So this is an example of doing the most watched items or most consumed items, because you know that a lot of people already are consuming this uh, as long as you're not getting really awful reviews, or maybe you are getting awful reviews, right? Like bad press is still press, I guess, by that logic. Um, and so, yeah, default recommendations. It's very, very easy to make these recommendations as an obvious pro, but is it the most effective? Um, there are obviously pros and cons. As we know by now, everything, the answer to everything on whether it's good or not is it depends. And for something like a non personalized recommendation engine, there are, you know, these pros and cons as well. Is it the most effective? Um, if you have a wealth of data, maybe not, right? Because you're not making use of the wealth of your user data or your item data to make recommendations. You are just telling people, all right, I'm going to just show you this. Uh, but in some cases where you are a perhaps a new business where you don't have much data on 
content on the users on your platform, a non-personalized recommendation can be a very, very effective way to actually gather this information to make better recommendations in the future. Um, so, so yeah, how you would do this in the back end, I would say it really depends on how your data is set up. The simplest form is if you have like a bunch of movies in a data frame, maybe you just sort it by rating and recommend the top few. Uh, if you want to give it other, other filters, you can do that as well. Those can, to some extent, be considered non-personalized as well. If you're filtering for specific genres, specific directors, actors, things like that, um, because they're just straight up filters and they're not really using any computation, um, I would consider those under non-personalized recommendation engines as well. So this is very, very simple. This concludes the first kind of recommendation engine. Questions at this point? All right, so next we'll move on to content-based recommendation engines. And the thing to remember about content-based recommendation engines is that you're making recommendations based on items features. Uh, so in this case, what is the data that you have? You have data on the items that you are eventually going to be pushing out to people. Um, so models that we already know can do this. Uh, I'm going to talk through some of those examples in a little bit. Um, yeah, how would you build a recommendation using models you already know? Um, just make sure that your data frame just contains information about the product itself. And if you have a big data frame or a big data set of product information and product characteristics, that is actually most suited for a content-based recommendation, uh, recommendation engine. So what are some different ways that we can um, build a recommendation engine based on this data? Um, one example is using nearest neighbors or any sort of distance metric. As long as all of you features, maybe even like do dummy variables, you could even one hot encode, do things like that. Once you have everything numerical, uh, you can pretty much compute distances. Very, very similar to K nearest neighbors, but instead of making some sort of classification result, uh, you are just locating the nearest neighbors. So for example, if I really like comedy movies, as an example, uh, let's say we have genre equals comedy to be this column. If genre equals comedy is in this column, and let me draw it out, you'll have every time you have a one, you know it's a comedy movie, and every time it's a zero, you know it's not a comedy movie. So let's say this first one is a comedy movie, and this is one that you know you like. I know I like movie number one. So what I have to do next is just look for the next movie uh, to find the next movie to recommend just look for the most similar movie to movie number one and this can be based on any sort of distance metric so for example if i'm doing things like euclidean distance the distance between one and one is zero uh, maybe if it has the same actors there's a higher chance of it being recommended same director higher chance of being recommended it also really depends on the features that you're throwing out there uh, when it comes to a content-based recommendation engine, um, you might think that, yeah, that sounds quite simple. You're just computing how different or similar all the movies are to some query movie. Uh, but you can really get uh, very creative with how you're dealing with your features. And that's what's really interesting. So for example, um, if you're thinking, all right, I'm trying to recommend a movie to my friend. And I ask my friend, all right, what kind of movies do you like? Um, usually people will tell you things like genre. Maybe they'll tell you things like, oh, I really like these actors, these directors. Um, how often does someone tell you, oh, I only like movies with a Rotten Tomatoes rating between like 85 and 90? I guess maybe sometimes, but um, with that variation and how important certain features are in making recommendations, you can actually get very creative in feature engineering your data. Um, or even feature selection. Like how important is it for you, and this is very context dependent as well, how, is it, how important is it for you to consider a year in doing recommendations for movies? Do people care uh, that um, if they like movies from 2015 that they wanna see movies that were made and released around 2015? It's really up to you, it's really up to your platform and what you're trying to recommend. And with things like that, you can really play around with re-weighting features. So in terms of, let's say for this recommendation system, I don't want to bias anything based on, or I don't want to make recommendations based on the year a movie was released. I might even consider dropping this entire column, or maybe I drop all these scoring metrics because I don't want to be, uh, I don't know, I don't want to feed into that whole system of ratings perhaps. 
Um, and then I can just, you know, play around with the weighting of this. Let's say I know that genre is more important, depending on what kind of metric you end up using. Maybe I take the genre column and like divide it by five. So that's how you get smaller distances for genres. Uh, if you're doing some sort of Euclidean distance or Manhattan distance, smaller distances will make it closer. So maybe I take the whole genre column and like divide it by five. Um, if I think a feature is little less important, but I still want to consider it, maybe I have like a bunch of dummy variables of actors. Uh, I can take that column and like multiply it by two. You can really play around with that and you're gonna get different results. Um, again, kind of dependent on the distribution of your data, but you can really play around with your features that way. And that's really, really interesting. Um, so that kind of uses an algorithm that we already know. Um, other examples, let's say that you have all of my Netflix information over the last, I don't know, let's say I've had Netflix for like five years and I have a bunch of data collected on how, like what movies I've seen, like the length of the movies I've seen. Um, and I can sort of proxy that into, okay, Maybe I don't rate thumbs up and thumbs down the movies I like, but you have a sense of what movies I like and don't like. You can build a classification model of like, all right, can we predict whether Ish likes these movies or not? And build a classification model on that. And that really only works if you have a lot of data on one person, but it's still a valid use case for a recommendation engine. Um, something else, you can also cluster your movies. We talked about clustering last week. Um, clustering is a way to uh, recommend groups of movies, I guess. So in your entire database of movies, maybe you group them into a hundred clusters of movies. And then if you know that someone falls within one cluster, just recommend them anything within that cluster. So a lot of different ways to go around this. Now in the clustering example, again, distance metrics will come into play as well. Um, cool. Any questions at this stage? Yeah. So mm -hmm. correct me if I'm getting this wrong but is it basically you pinpoint one feature and then you go jump to another and then jump to another and sort of that's how that's basically how the the recommendation system works is that kind is of that, yeah right? kind of so here let me do a really quick example let's just say we like movie one, and here we have genre number one, actor two, director number four, and let's just use these three columns for now. And let's just say I'm trying to choose between, all right, do I recommend movies two, three, or four? So let's just say here I have genre zero, genre two, and let's just assume that everything can be encoded with a number. Uh, what we want to do here is just look for the movie that has the smallest overall distance. So let's just say like this, just some random numbers. So out of these three movies, what looks to be the most similar? So it depends on what similarity metric you're using. So let's just use Manhattan distance because that's the easiest one. Manhattan distance is literally summing up the differences in the numbers. So the difference here is one minus one is zero, four minus four is zero. So the difference here will just be 13. The difference here will be one plus four plus one, that's six. And the difference here is going to be one plus five plus two, that's eight. So this is just one way of computing distance. There are different ways that you can do it. But based on that, I would actually recommend movie three, whatever movie three is. Does that make sense? So in a way, yes, you're going feature by feature, but that's just a way of computing similar movies. So based on the, is it because the value of three is the smallest distance? Is that why it's? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. smallest distance is implying more similar. Ah, okay. All mm -hmm. right, I, I, I'm getting it now. Thank you. Awesome, you're welcome. Anything else? Cool, this is actually a good segue into the next slide, which is on similarity metrics. Uh, this is just a list of simili similarity metrics. So uh, the one I just used is actually called Manhattan distance, uh, which is just the difference between the coordinates. These are just some others. Euclidean distance, basically Pythagoras theorem. Jacquard index is a really interesting one because it looks at the ratio of how many uh, features are shared over how many features are not shared or the other way around, not shared over shared. Basically a 
ratio of the intersect over the union. And in different use cases, it is slightly different, but that's another way of computing how similar things are. Cosine similarity and adjusted cosine similarity imagines that every movie is a point in feature space and you're drawing angles between those points. And that's how you define similarity through cosine similarity. Peers and correlation as well. Um, it's just looking at how correlated are the movies. You're literally just running, a, yeah, the correlation that we already know. All right. Um, so with content-based recommendation engines, uh, here are the pros and cons. So um, one pro is that, okay, actually, let me talk about one con because this is a funny one. Uh, for those of you who saw my workshop already, this is not a, a relevant joke anymore. But um, basically three years ago, I ordered a plant on Amazon. I just thought it was hilarious because that plant died. And then I just kept getting recommended plants on Amazon, even though I never wanted to see another plant again. Uh, so that is one con of a content-based recommendation says, uh, a content-based recommendation engine. I'll also admit that at that time, I wasn't using Amazon very much. So pretty much the only purchase that they had for me was, was a plant. Uh, so this was the only thing that they could make recommendations for. Because they only knew that I bought a plant, all of their recommendations for me were just plants and I didn't need to see that. Um, so you end up being uh, kind of typecast or you have this kind of pigeonhole effect if you don't have a lot of information. This is quite common with content-based recommendation engines. Even looking at movies, if, you know, if let's say I only use Netflix to watch, you know, bad comedy movies, Netflix is probably going to recommend bad, co bad comedy movies to me and not much else. Uh, of course, Netflix's recommendation engine is a lot more complex than that now, uh, but in a simple recommendation engine, those would be some pitfalls. Um, there is also the pro of uh, content-based recommendation engines is that there is no cold start problem. Cold start problem is something we'll talk about later, but basically you don't need a lot of information to start building a content-based recommendation system. With that prior example of, um, of the movies here, wait, hold on, of the movies over here, you just need one query movie. You just need to know one kind of movie that a user likes, and then you can start making recommend recommendations from there. So there isn't a need to collect a lot of data on a single user first before you can start making recommendations. And that's a con that we're actually gonna see in the next kind of recommendation uh, engine. All right, let me go next. Oh no, why is this happening? All right, um, another pro, which is kind of, I guess two-sided coin of being very typecast. If you have very, very specific interests, content-based recommendation engines might work better. All right. So that ends content-based recommendation engines. Basically, we can use a lot of the models that we already know uh, to build these kinds of recommendation engines. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about, and the one that the content is very heavily focused on, is collaborative filtering recommendation engines. And to start that, we're first going to talk about the utility matrix. A utility matrix is the kind shows the kind of data that you're going to need in order to start building collaborative filtering recommendation engines. Um, just an FYI, the project uh, is actually movie recommendations. Um, and you will get this kind of data. So the project is actually collaborative filtering recommendation engines. So to start, we have this utility matrix. Now, what does the utility matrix show? It basically shows an array of ratings or some sort of proxy for ratings between movies or items and users. So here you can see this is how it usually starts. Uh, because not every user has seen every movie, you can expect that to be a uh, expect there to be a lot of blanks. So in this uh, image on the left here, you can see that user one has seen movie one and movie N, rated movie one a one, rated movie N a three. And we're just gonna assume that it's rated one through five. Uh, user two has only seen movies two and N, uh, and here user M had only seen movie N. So this is how utility matrix usually starts off. Um, we're just representing, and the only data that we need for collaborative filtering is just this connection between all movies and all users, uh, and these are their ratings. Now, it doesn't always have to be one through five. It can actually also be like true false on whether you know they've looked at a page or not, or maybe Boolean values of whether they even clicked on a certain movie on Netflix, so on and so forth. 
the idea of collaborative filtering is we're going to try and fill in these blanks and then recommend items with the highest predictions. So for user one, as an example, uh, based on the algorithm that we'll talk through later, uh, let's just say that it filled up this matrix to have a four for movie two and a two for movie three. Now, based on this, we're just going to recommend movie two because movie two has the highest rating of a movie that user one has not seen yet. Same for any of these other users. So let's say for user four um, had already seen movies one and two, but here for movies, movie three and N, the predicted rating is two and three, four, five. We're going to recommend 3.5. Any questions about what we're about to embark on? Okay, so let's talk through what collaborative filtering is. Collaborative filtering, uh, the word collaborative is sort of implying that we're making recommendations based on ratings or based on the patterns of other users. So there are many different ways to do collaborative filtering. We're gonna talk through um, a couple of those ways. Now there are memory-based methods, which I'm gonna say now, uh, we don't really use memory-based methods anymore. Uh, now because we have model-based methods. But I still think it is uh, pretty useful to know these memory-based methods. And I'll just show you all in some documentation later where you can actually try and implement some of these memory-based methods if you want to just compare different models. All right. So within memory-based methods, we're going to walk through two quick examples, one using user-to-user -user similarity and one using item-to-item -item similarity. And then later we'll talk about the matrix factorization method, and that's the one that is most well known, most famous. All right, there's a lot on this slide, but let's talk about user to user collaborative filtering. So the idea of user to user collaborative filtering is that we're filling up this utility matrix based on user similarities. So I've set up this very, very simple utility matrix over here. And I mean, usually it's very sparse, but for the purpose of this, we're just trying to figure out the prediction for user one and item three. So in this small example, uh, all of the other user and items have ratings. So user two has rated everything, user three and four have also rated everything, and item one, two, and four all have their ratings. So that's the only thing that we have, we wanna figure out what this question mark is. So two steps, uh, a little bit long steps, so we'll go through this. So first we're gonna figure out user similarity values. So that's where the user to user part comes in. So the user similarity values, you can use any of the similarity metrics that we talked about before. Uh, and these are also built into Python, all of these. Uh, but let's just say for user one, because we're trying to target user one, what is the similarity between user one and each of the other users? So I took cosine similarity and I basically <clears throat> keyed it in, what's the cosine similarity between user one and user two? And it happens to be 0.65. I repeated the same process for user three and four. Uh, user three has a similarity of 0.76 and user four has a similarity of 0.83. So just based on these numbers, uh, the most similar user is user four because the number is higher. I think if the number is closer to one is the most similar. Uh, next, what we're going to do, because once we have these similarity numbers, the predicted rating is a weighted average of others' ratings. So what does that mean? Uh, we're going to wait because we know these other users have already rated this item three. We're going to take a weighted average. So these numbers, 0 0.65, 0 0.76, 0 0.83, they come here, 65, 76, 83 times four times five times four. That comes from here, four, five, and four. Then we're going to take a weighted average, which means that we actually divide it by the sum of these weights. So we're going to divide it by 2.24, and we end up with a predicted rating of 4.34. So if we're using user-to-user -user collaborative filtering, we end up with a predicted rating of this question mark to be 4.34. Any questions about this? Okay. Before we talk about the next one, let's go through some quick pros and cons. So <clears throat> obvious con is that your ratings are going to be personalized for each user. It's also, um, you know, you're not also just giving someone something based off, a, based off of a similarity metric. I mean, kind of is based on a similarity metric, but you can actually predict how much someone will like something. So 
I can actually say, all right, we think that you will rate this roughly 4.3 stars. So having that degree of information to give to a user or to use in your own, for your own purposes also, but you know, it's good to know that you have that additional information. Um, so that's a quick pro. Uh, a few cons. So first, it's computationally heavy. So this example was done for four users and four items, and there are quite a few steps that we had to go through, right? We first had to compute the similarity between user one and every other user. Now you can imagine in on a platform where you have like thousands of users or like millions of users, this can take very, very long. Um, and then not only that, you're taking some sort of weighted average. Uh, you're doing another step of computing. You have to look at everyone else's everyone else's ratings and then take that weighted average. So it can get very computationally heavy, especially once you have more users, more items. Next, you also have popularity bias. So something about popularity bias is you can, you'll see that if I were to change these values here to five and five, this will actually also work out to be five. So that goes to show that yes, it is taking other users' uh, preferences into account. And so if you've ever had like an unpopular opinion or if you have, if you like something that everyone else doesn't like, this, that will not be captured using collaborative filtering, unfortunately. So that's something that's good to know as well. Um, next, the last con that I have here is the cold start problem, which is what I mentioned before. Uh, before in content-based uh, recommendation end is you don't need a lot of information to start making recommendations, but for collaborative filtering, you do. Imagine what happens if this user didn't rate anything before. If you had no ratings here, here, or here, you won't even be able to start this process because you can't even compute similarities between this user and something else. Perhaps what you could do to circumvent this is look for other metrics of finding out similarity. Maybe you go by like um, their user profiles that they use when they sign up, maybe base it off something like demographics, but demographics are not always indicative of, you know, preferences. So that becomes a little bit tricky. The cold start problem is a big problem for collaborative filtering algorithms, which is why um, even Netflix, when you sign up for a Netflix account, I remember I did this when I signed up like years ago, but they asked me to rate a couple movies. Like they flashed a couple movies and like, oh, do you like this? Yes or no? Do you like this, yes or no? That's likely to help them get over their cold start problem so they can start to get a sense of what you actually like first. Any questions on this? Yeah, um, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Uh, can you can you explain again the how to get how you got the like the 0. 0.65, the 0. Mm -hmm. 0.76? How, how did you get that again? <clears throat> So these numbers are just similarity values. I literally just plugged in, uh, what I did was, hold on, let me annotate it here. So um, user one has four, three, and three here, right? right? What I did was I plugged this into using, I think I use SciPy for this. How similar is four, three, three to two, two, two? And that gives you 0.65. How similar is it to three, four, four? That gives you 0.76. How similar is it to five, two, four? And that gives you 0.83. So in a similar way, uh, you can also use distance. And if I use distance like Manhattan distance from before, these numbers will be slightly different uh, because they're measured on a different scale, but similar to that. So if I were to use Manhattan distance, my numbers would be, let's see, two plus one plus one. Here would be four. Uh, here would be one plus one plus one. This would be three. This would be one, one, one. This would also be three. And then I would actually weight it out of these numbers here. So that would be the Manhattan distance. And what would be the this particular? This is using cosine similarity. Oh, OK. Right. Which is just another, another method of computing distance. OK. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any, any other questions? I'm going to keep drinking this tea because my throat is <laughs> just from talking all day. It's a little sore. All right. All right. So we've gone through these pros and cons. Next, let's talk about item to item collaborative filtering. And you'll see that this actually looks very, very similar to what we did with the user to user. We're only doing it across a different axis. So here we're doing it based on item similarities. So instead of computing user similarities, like what I was just talking about, uh, we're going to do it on items. So if I were to draw, 
This 0.78 comes from comparing 454 to 235. This 0.83 comes from comparing 454 to 242. 0.87 comes from comparing 454 to 244. So this is where how we get our item similarity values. And then very similar process, we're just going to weight it based on um, the item ratings that uh, the other users gave. So you can see here this 4, 3, and 3 corresponds to 4, 3, and 3 over here. Divided by 2.48, which is the sum of all of these, and we get a predictor rating using item to item similarity of 3.31. So a very similar process as we did before, we're just pretty much flipping users and items. Now you can see that the numbers that we got are quite different. Uh, for this one, we get 3.31. And if we go back to what we had before, we have 4.34. So just by doing this computation off of a different axis and off of different similarity of different ways of computing similarity, we're getting like a whole star off of um, a, a whole star's difference in our predictions. Any questions about this? Um, I'd have one. So mm -hmm. do companies usually kind of record these predictions and compare to the actual rating once the user looks at it and then improve the model that way? That's interesting. I, I actually don't know how big companies do it. I know that in the past when I have worked on recommendation engines for other people, um, what we do is we don't, do any sort of, we do some evaluation of our recommendations, like out of what we're recommending, recommending to people, what is like the click through rate of things we recommend versus just things that they randomly click on, and then work on trying to recommend those things that they actually clicked on. Um, I can see a scenario where you're comparing different recommendation engines, like maybe some people get user to user, some people get item to item, see which one performs better, like an A-B test. Um, but I think in terms of evaluating your recommendation engines. Re evaluating recommendation engines is very, very difficult because you don't have, uh, it's very hard to say, all right, yeah, um, you don't have data to tell you, yes, this person would have rated this a five, you know? Uh, so I think there's a lot of creativity and I think there's a lot of flexibility in how you want to evaluate. Even for these projects and your capstone as well, if you were to do a recommendation engine, if you're recommending something via like content-based filtering, or sorry, based on content-based recommendation engines or via filtering, um, it's the, the methods of validating that are a lot less scientific. Um, and the way that you design a way of validation usually takes time and is something that you can only evaluate after you implement the engine. Okay. Um, I guess yeah. a follow-up would then be like, in a train test split scenario, would you just like also take like 20% of your data or your users or your items, depending on what you're comparing, and then like just mm -hmm. remove certain ratings that they, you know, that they did and then have the... See how it corresponds. Yeah. That's like, exactly how train test split does work for collaborative filtering. Ah, so I'm okay. glad you mentioned that. I'll show you all, I'll show you all that example in the notebook later. Gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? All right, so next up, let's talk about the differences between user to user and item to item first. So which is better? Um, in general, item to item has proven to be more effective because it is hard to predict users unique tastes. And what that means, if you go into the math and take a look at it, it's easier to put similar items together versus put similar users together. Um, next, there's also the time complexity element that you might want to take into account. Uh, like for if you have n users and n items, what is the most computationally um, challenging part of this algorithm is the fact that you have to compute these similarity values. So if you have more users, you might want to do item to item filtering. If you have more items, you might want to do user to user collaborative fil uh, user to user collaborative filtering because you don't have to compute as many of those similarity values. So if you have more users and items, you would usually do item to item collaborative filtering. Um, and then next, in terms of similarity metrics, experimentally, Pearson correlation has for some reason demonstrated to be the best, uh, uh, to be the best similarity metric to use. Um, it is not 
uh, is based, the way that they've decided on this was just to look and see how successful recommendation engines have been. And the ones that use Pearson correlation just happen to be more well liked or more receptive to users um, validation, I guess. But it's not something that's like, oh, always use Pearson correlation. Actually, if you're using different uh, similarity metrics, the results are usually very similar. So let's talk about model-based collaborative filtering, which is kind of like the meat of what this topic is all about. And what we're going to do is a process of modified singular value decomposition. So this is actually not the first time that we've seen singular value decomposition or SVD. SVD is actually the exact process used for getting our principal components from PCA. Um, so I actually should mark over here that what we're doing is modified. SVD. And modified SVD uh, is a way for us to fill a utility matrix via matrix factorization. So matrix factorization, if you remember the word factorization from like, I don't know, high school math, if you had like an equation like x squared plus 2x plus 1, this was like a quadratic equation. And if they ask you to factorize it, Factorizing an equation is representing something as a uh, as a product of multiple things, right? So if you were to factorize this, it gives you x plus one times x plus one, and that's the process of factorization, representing something as a product of a bunch of component things. So SVD typically takes a matrix, a giant matrix, and splits it up into three parts. Now PCA does that exactly that way. PCA does SV, the SVD used by PCA is the traditional way of doing SVD, where you split it up into three parts. One of them actually becomes your principal components. Um, for recommendation engines, we're not doing that process. What we're doing is we're breaking down this utility matrix into two matrices instead of three. Uh, and there are user matrix and our item matrix. Other dimensions are latent features. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, then this sentence is a little crazy but a process of gradient descent using alternating least squares to preserve relationship between items and users is done to fill in these ratings. And we're actually gonna walk through that algorithm because I think it's really, really cool. Uh, it's very heavy in math, but the best in class models use some form of S SVD. A lot of the award-winning recommendation engines for like competitions all use some form of SVD, which is super cool. Okay. So this is a quick example of what we're doing. Uh, again, we're using this exact same utility matrix as we had before, and we're trying to represent this as a product of two matrices. So the two matrices will be our item matrix over here and our user matrix over here. Now, you can see in our item matrix, we have two columns, or I guess you have two values representing each item. Uh, these two values are just some representation of these items. What you can think of these as, and it was very helpful for me to think about these, is you can sort of think of these as like PCA values of that represent an item. So these two values are kind of like a two-dimensional representation of this item. What it actually is, you cannot interpret it. Also really doesn't matter how you interpret it, but it's how the model interprets it. So item one is represented by these two X's. User four is represented by these two X's. And exactly what those two X's mean, not important for now. Um, but basically, we're going to use this process to figure out what this number is. Next slide is going to have a little bit more. Okay, clear this. Okay, so how do we do this and how do we solve for this one little thing? This looks like an overcomplicated process to solve for just one number, but I'll talk about why that is more helpful than doing it any other way. So as we know with gradient descent, uh, how gradient descent works, if you don't remember from like the start of phase three, start of last phase, like two months ago, we talked about gradient descent. You always start with really, really bad values, and then you slowly make it get better by adjusting these values. So let's do this. We're going to first initialize our component matrices. Um, it's also helpful to think about this as we are not only trying to just figure out or uh, insert the correct number into here. Uh, the gradient descent way of doing this is we're going to try to actually recreate this matrix as much as possible. And so how do we recreate that? We're just going to multiply these two component matrices together to come up with a matrix that matches the dimensions of our utility matrix. 
So this is our original utility matrix. I'm always going to have it here in the next few slides. OG stands for original. And these are the values that we have. And again, we have to figure out what this value is. We're going to initialize these component matrix values to be all ones. So here, everything is a one. And using matrix multiplication, if you actually multiply all these ones out for this four times four matrix, every value just becomes two. Matrix multiplication, not super important. Uh, but I mean, if you are if you were to do this by hand, it is important. But you just take for granted that this is correct. When you multiply all of these ones and these two matrices together, you get a matrix of twos. Now, for a gradient descent, remember, we always have some sort of cost function, right? Like when we we're doing linear regression, um, our cost function was how far away are the points from the line. Your points never fit the line perfectly, and therefore you never get like a perfect R squared. But your points never fit the line perfectly, but your points always get better. Your line always fits the points better and better with each iteration. So very similar to that, we're also going to use RMSE here. But instead of, you know, matching line to a, to a bunch of points, we're just going to match these numbers as close as possible. So this RMSE of 1.75 is the difference between is the element-wise difference between these matrices. So 1.75 is the average difference between the two here and the four here, the two, 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 and three, two, and five. And just computing all the distances, um, RMSE becomes 1.75 to start. And this is our initial uh, value of RMSE. And our goal here is to get our RMSE to be as low as possible, because once our RMSE is as low as possible, this recreated utility matrix with all 16 values will be the closest it can be to our original utility matrix. I know that was a lot, but any questions at this point before we move on to actually doing the screen descent? OK. Oh, based on time, I think we might go a little over, but that's OK. OK. So gradient descent with alternating least squares. This next process is known as alternating least squares, and we'll, we'll see why, because we're doing least squares. Um, so let's, how this process works is we're actually going to go through each value and figure out what is a better value than one that, be, that could belong there. So let's start with this X over here. So if we set this to be X and we re-multiply these matrices out, what happens is that instead of two, this entire row is going to evaluate to X plus one, just based on matrix multiplication. So next, what's the best value of x then to make the RMSE between this matrix and this matrix to be as low as possible? And how we do that is we find the least squared diff, uh, we find the least squared of that of this equation at the bottom. So how we generate this it looks pretty crazy, but the numbers are actually if you see four, two, three, and five correspond to four, two, three, and five over here. And we're finding the difference between that and x plus 1. So we're finding the RMSE. So we're actually taking the difference squared. And we're trying to minimize this equation as much as possible. Um, if we set d, dx equal to 0, which is if you take a first derivative, not important for, for us right now. But basically, the best value of x at this moment is actually 2.5. So they're saying that if we put 2.5 over here, our RMSE uh, will be the lowest at this point. So what does that give us on the next slide? If I adjust this to be 2.5, this entire row becomes 3.5. And the overall RMSE has dropped from 1.75 down to 1.58. And that's one iteration of doing alternating least squares. Now it's called alternating these squares because we're going to repeat this process over and over again for all of these values. And not only once, right? After we, let's say, finish all 16 of these ones and we've gone through it once, very likely 2.5 is no longer going to be the best value anymore. So we're going to repeat this process over and over again, pretty much almost infinitely until the RMSE can't get any better. Any questions about this? All right, so I actually ran this exact data through uh, SVD, and I'll show you all what that's going to look like in a little bit. And these eventually don't even matter. What matters now is that this is our utility matrix. And you can see that this um, gives us 3.7 over here. 
So based on this ALS or alternating least squares gradient descent that's being done, this predicted value is 3.7. And now our overall RMSE is 1.15. Uh, 1.5 is down from 1.75. So I think we've improved it by roughly, what is it? Roughly like 30, 40%. So not bad, pretty good. Um, so uh, what's really neat about this is there is this term known as parallelizable. This process is parallelizable because um, if we change a single value in any one of these matrices, we're always updating an entire row or an entire column at a time. And that process is what helps them maintain their relationships within an item and within a user, uh, which is really, really neat. Okay, so yeah. So based on that, we have an overall RMSE of 1.15. That process is repeated over and over again. These are all parallelizable. And you can see that if you wanted to use a model's prediction, and if we had a lot more blanks in here, um, it wouldn't really affect the ability to do this. Cool. Any questions about this algorithm before we get into implementation? All right, here's a quick summary of what we did, and let's get into this notebook. So um, the library that we use for running our recommendation engines for specifically collaborative filtering recommendation engines is called SURPRISE. It stands for Simple Python Recommendation System Engine, barely. Uh, and we're actually, in this example, going to go over the movie lens data set, which is actually the project data set. Uh, and then we're actually going to go through a Yelp example. Um, something that's very, very important to note, SURPRISE is actually built on top of scikit-learn. So it has a lot of the same scikit-learn functionalities. However, uh, I highly, highly recommend that if you're doing surprise, uh, be careful what you're importing. So as you can see from here, surprise has its own cross validate and train test split. It even has its own like accuracy score. I know for the secular version is accuracy underscore score, uh, but be careful that you're using surprises version of these for doing surprise processes. Cause I've seen a lot of people saying, hey, my train test split isn't working. Uh, for my surprise, and it's because they're using scikit-learn's train test split, which is optimized for scikit-learn processes, whereas surprise's train test split is optimized for surprise's processes. So take note of that. Um, cool. So so happens to be that, oh no, what happened here? Okay, I'm not going to run this because I don't know what's going on. Um, but Never mind about this. This code works, especially if you're not on. I upgraded my Python, so that could be, I think that's what's going on, but not to worry. Okay, we're going to load in this data set. This is a built in data set from um, a built in data set from Surprise, and it is the movie lens data set. It's basically a bunch of movies, users, items, and their ratings. So, what we're going to do, we have the data. We're just going to do a quick chain test split, test size 0.2 as usual. We have our chain set. Now, the downside of using surprise is that once you feed it into this data set object, and I'll show you what this is later, uh, you cannot actually inspect your data. So it actually puts everything into objects, which actually makes it a lot more efficient, but it's just harder for us to see what's going on. Uh, the process is very similar to scikit learn models. All we're doing is we're instantiating the SVD model, dot fit on the chain set, dot predict on the test set. And just like that, we have a model that can make uh, predictions. You can look at the overall accuracy of your predictions and this predictions. Now this RMSE, don't confuse this RMSE with the gradient descent RMSE because these are different. Uh, this RMSE, as Nelson was alluding to earlier, we have a bunch of ratings that we already know from our test set. And what we're gonna do is we're looking at, okay, these people's actual ratings versus their predicted ratings. So RMC is slightly different, but kind of the same, because you're kind of com also computing predictive versus actual. But anyways, that's what the accuracy is. So we have an average error of about one star off. Uh, and if you want to make predictions, for this specific data set, take note that their user and item IDs are in strings, which is why these have to be in strings. So make sure that your input information is following the same format as your uh, data. If you're doing dot predict, you have to give it a particular user, a particular item. The real rating, this is an optional argument. 
verbose equals of true will basically output this. So you're saying for user number 196 and item number 302, the estimator rating is 4.25 and the real rating was four. So we can know there were only 0.25 stars off. That's pretty good. Okay, so that was just really, really quick implementation. Now let's use an actual data set. Um, so here I'm using the Yelp data set. This is actually what I did my capstone project on, which is, I would say now a little too simple for a capstone project. But anyways, um, here's just a subset of the data. And for Yelp, they use stars, one to five stars. You have a particular user ID and a business ID over here. If we're doing a EDA for recommendation systems, it's going to look quite different from the EDA that we've seen so far. Um, for this, I'm just looking, all right, how many users do we have? Almost 80K. We have 2,500 businesses as well. Maybe you can look at what's the distribution of your ratings. How many reviews does a restaurant have? How many reviews does a user have? So here's the distribution of ratings. We can see if we do value counts of businesses, some businesses have uh, almost 1,700 reviews. Some businesses have three. Um, and you can do the same thing for users as well. That, those, that's the kind of EDA that you would do for recommendation engine. Next, uh, something, this is one of the nuances that, uh, one of the nuances about surprise that makes it different from scikit-learn. Uh, so I have my data here. And remember that we had our utility matrix before. Um, this is not a utility matrix. However, it's a more efficient way of representing what's in a utility matrix. Because if I have 80K users and 2,500 businesses, that's a very, very large utility matrix. Uh, this is kind of coordinate style way of representing a sparse matrix like a utility matrix. So it's just saying, all right, for user, for this user, for this business, this is the number of stars. And you can see here, like the first few businesses here are all the same. Last few businesses are all the same as well. Um, so based on that, this is just a much more efficient way of storing the information. We only have 10, 100,000 rows times three columns versus if we were to do like, what is it, 80,000 by 2,500, that's like 80,000 times 2,500. That's like, I don't even know, that's a lot of zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, that's 200 million, uh, 200 million values versus 300,000 values. So this is much more efficient way of storing utility matrix information. So reading in this data into surprise is a couple additional steps. So first you have to instantiate this reader object. And this is where you actually give it the rating scale because it's important for it to know what are the upper and lower boundaries of what you can rate something. So in this data set, you're bounded by one and five, so do that. If for some reason, like maybe your movie ratings can go into zero, you'll put zero to five. And then you can use a load from BF um, method to load in user, business, and stars in that order and also feed in the reader objects so that it, you know, knows that your data is bounded by one and five. Here I'm doing my train test bit again, and this is actually what my test set is. And then same thing, you have your SVD model that I'm instantiating. You also have a bunch of hyperparameters, and I'm going to walk through those hyperparameters super, super quick in a little bit. Fit on your train, predict on your final. These are my predictions. And then you can see your overall accuracy. And then you can make your predictions. Um, I want to go through the SVD model super quick. Where is it? Uh, where's the model link? Is it this one? No, never mind. Let's just go on to surprise documentation. OK, so first let me show you all of the different kinds of models that surprise has. The one that we've talked about today is this SVD. Uh, algorithm. And these are all different models that you can import and implement. And they all implement the same way as well. Uh, KNN basic is item to item collaborative filtering. So if you want to try that out, that's KNN basic. Pretty much for this project, you can try all of these if you want. Um, so that's that. Now within SVD, some of the uh, parameters that are important, N factors is the number of latent features. Pretty much how many dimensions does each user and each item have? That's n factors. Uh, next, there is n epochs, number of iterations. So the default is 20 iteration. One iteration is basically when you go through and adjust all of these values one time, that's one epoch. If you want to do it a second round, that's two epochs. The default is 20. Uh, there's also a bit of regularization that you can play around with. 
But those are the main things. So as you can see over here, I did n epochs equal 20, one n factors equal one, uh, regularization and learning rate. Bias, I forget exactly what bias is. What is biased? Not here either. Okay, never. Oh, whether you use baselines or bias. Uh, it says read above, so you all can read above. Um, cool. Um, within Surprise, there's also grid search. So if you look at model selection, there is a grid search. So you can use grid search. Make sure that you're using the grid search from here, not the grid search from Scikit-Learn. Cool. Any questions at this point? I know I'm kind of rushing through a lot of things, but any, any questions? Yeah, so when you would, if you want to adjust your models, would you adjust the epochs and the n factor? And mm -hmm. also, is it better to, if you're going to adjust it, is it better to decrease it or increase it? Mm. Or does it matter? Um, it could go either way. Uh, and epochs, the more epochs you do, the more overfit it can get. Um, what else? Um, for number of factors it depends as well because for typically more factors leads to more overfitting also leads to your model taking longer to run same for epochs regularization is something that can help control that so it's kind of you have to play with everything in combination and you can set up grid search the exact same way um i don't know if it shows over here but you can see here that you feed in the model you give it the grid so you're pretty much setting it up the same way as your scikit-learn grid search as well mm. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Cool. Some final things I want to mention. Um, you can also do a combination of content based and collaborative filtering. I would not worry about it for this project. Definitely not this project, unless you have a lot of time. But I don't think anyone has a lot of time. Um, there's this library called LightFM that is very, very cool. Uh, you can actually combine content based and collaborative filtering. And how it does that is that first you do your collaborative filtering and you can sort of think of it as it's re-weighting your ratings based on similarities between your items. So that's pretty cool. Um, also, um, I wrote my last couple of blogs about this. So if you want to read it, it's pretty much written out of what I said today. So you can click on that if you'd like. Um, but yeah, with that, any questions? I don't know why this is happening. I don't think you all should have this issue. It's a, yeah, it looks to be a Python 3.9 thing. But yeah, any final questions before we call it for the week? Uh, so for if we wanted to do a recommendation system for our project, would we mm -hmm. have to do each, say, uh, would we have to do a non-personalized uh, content-based mm -hmm. and a collaborative or just one of the three? Great question. Only collaborative filtering. Uh, okay. and. I would say just go into surprise uh, and then oops, this one and pick a few. I would say pick at least four or pick four to go with. And in those four, at least do SVD and maybe pick three others and do it in the same way that you did your last project. Got it. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? All right, well, anything else, feel free to let me know via Slack or at our one on ones that are coming up. Um, and yeah, if you want to do a recommendation system project, just let me know. You can already start working on it if you'd like. If there's nothing else, next week is time series week. We have two time series study groups. Um, the first one's going to be on like setting up time series data, the second one will be on the actual time series modeling. Uh, I'll talk more about the project as well for time series next week. But if there are no other questions, have a good rest of your week, everybody. I'll talk to you all soon, and I'll see you back here next Tuesday. Bye, everybody. Have a good night. Have a great night. Bye.